Think so. Think I think so. I think. Do you want to do a countdown? Oh, we are now live, everyone. All right, we're ready to go. Okay. All right, we're ready to go. Um, well, here we are at Stanford, and we're very um, happy to be joined this time. Uh, this time live with Harvard, um, and also at the next hangout next week, she'll be here, but she'll be joining us for Cambridge for our. That would be to me. Howard Reingold up in uh, Marin and then Doris in Cambridge. And we'll talk a lot about um, the idea of uh, creativity and collaboration. And today, um, Doris and I thought that we'd just start off by each talking very briefly about uh, some of the things we want to bring to the table. But as I said in my email, we're going to really flip this hangout. So we want students to basically ask each other questions, uh, respond to the questions that we've come up with. We have very few, like half a dozen, but we'd really like to make this more, as as, inter, as, as Kathy said, as interactive as possible, even given our, our limited technological setup here. So maybe, Doris, do you want to say a few words uh, to get us started from your point of view, and then I'll add some stuff? Well, um, I could uh, continue the line that Kathy began, uh, which was to observe the, uh, the difference in um, in readings, depending on one's positionality, uh, one's experience, uh, one's racial, gender, identitarian position in general, uh, but in the cases that we were talking about uh, in terms of organ transplants, also one's experience. Um, I wrote years ago, and I mentioned this to you, David, um, a book called Proceed with Caution to develop what I hoped uh, we could call a rhetoric of particularism because our, um, our rules for rhetoric, our lessons for rhetoric, still depend on a classic notion that writer and reader, or speaker and public, share a set of assumptions and experiences. This is the Greek notion of rhetoric. So the best rhetorician is the one who understands best his or her, uh, usually his, public's uh, expectations and um, expectations. But today, uh, I think what we need is a more fine-tuned rhetoric, uh, a, a greater vocabulary in literary criticism and in, in cultural criticism in general that accounts for the ways that writers and speakers play on difference, on spots of ignorance, on dissonance, on um, divergence rather than convergence. Uh, I studied this more with an eye to um, <coughs> ethnic differences. Uh, a good ethnic writer knows how to play his or her reader like uh, a bullfighter knows how to play a bull. Uh, and the, the formula that organizes that book comes from Toni Morrison. When Paul Gilroy asked her, how come uh, Beloved became a hit, you know, a bestseller when it's such a difficult book. Mm. She answered, the book works like jazz. It slaps and embraces. It slaps and embraces. And she, she repeated that in, in the rhythm. I thought that was brilliant. A good minority writer welcomes in a hungry, curious, imperialist reader mm. and then puts a stop on them and says, you don't own me. Mm -hmm. And then continues again to seduce and to reject. And that's the tightrope that, um, that good ethnically marked writers uh, know how to walk. And I think that what I was hearing, at least because I've, I, I worked on this issue, what I was hearing from Kathy is um, this observation that there's no ideal reader, that uh, good writers know how to predict that divergence and um, and not uh, assume that there's going to be one uh, kind of ideal reading. Uh, they know that um, that these books are, are used in different ways and, and try to manage that use, uh, as I said in, in the uh, case of uh, ethnically marked writers. Uh, but I think that that's one thing that we might attend to as students of literature and culture in general, 
the fact that there's no one audience anymore and no one yeah. ideal uh, reception. Um, did you want to talk about the questions you want us to think about, and then I can add mine? Well, the questions, uh, you know, maybe um, jumping the gun now, but in general, the questions that I just added as corollaries to David's questions and maybe to other questions we could think of are in the line of um, a millennial tradition in the humanities of civic engagement and ethical uh, engagement um, so that any question would have as an addendum, now what do we do? Mm -hmm. And uh, just briefly, one way to uh, frame this question is a memory that I have of Rigoberta Menchu addressing many of us Latin Americans at a conference in Washington. She said she loves to come and talk to academics because academics know how to analyze and criticize and study and criticize some more. And then in her uh, ironic way, she paused and said, and then what do you do? Mm -hmm. yeah. We poor people have to imagine the next, stop, uh, a next step. So whatever questions we come up with, uh, I think are productive in that direction of uh, inviting us to speculate. Even if we don't come up with answers, uh, we get a little wiggle room to feel less paralyzed. And you know the reason I've asked Doris to speak after I spoke because you know it's a very dark book if you have, if you haven't noticed, um, and so we're, we're approaching this idea of creativity and collaboration, both from the dark nightmarish side, which obviously the novel portrays, but also in um, Doris's work the capacity to do something beyond the routine, which you find these clones sort of stuck in. I'll just say a few words about the book that. Um, Deliverance of Others, and I was telling Doris when I read her um, the preface to her new book, she and I share the rare distinction of having Larry Summers appear in both of our books in the preface right. in, in weird ways. Um, and you know, exactly as Doris was saying, I was very interested in this idea of otherness that exceeds the capacity of a system to accommodate it. Right? We are tied together through all these either um, biological or financial or um, are the kinds of networks, assuming that um, there's an overabundance of, of sameness that will cure, that will let the system operate. But exactly as Doris was saying, what I'm interested in is uh, not only the occurrence of otherness, but a intolerable otherness that is interesting because of the ethical stance it forces you to take at that point. And uh, education is so central to Never Let Me Go that I thought that it would be a great book for us to discuss in terms of exactly the tolerance of otherness. Um, and remember, and we've talked a lot about clones uh, so far, but the original title of the, of the uh, manuscript was uh, the student's novel. It had nothing to do with clones. And so he imagined this narrative solely in terms of a critique or a commentary on the educational system and what it means to become educated. Uh, and again, as, uh, as we've said, how much tolerance for difference is there? So my three questions are this. Uh, one is, um, how familiar is Never Let Me Go? It's very easy to look at the book and say it's totally weird and can never imagined this. But there's an eerie sense of familiarity, I think, that I'd like to have people talk about, you know, how it does seem uh, so common, even, in its, even with its very weird premise. Second is, uh, how do you feel about Ishiguro's um, notion that, well, art is for, and art in a sense contained within a pedagogy, is for protection, right? That the schools are a kind of incubated, incubational space where you are protected from interacting with society so that you can gain a kind of strength, but the counter-argument might be a kind of callousness as well. And finally, um, in what way, and this is sort of the pressing the envelope question, oh, in, what ways, in what ways are the clones actually just like students are in general, right? They're, they're put through a kind of pedagogical experience, they're asked to sacrifice certain life ambitions so as to feed back into society, uh, give their life to society, as it were, for a very narrow set of options. And then hopefully we can move from those mo rather morbid questions to ones that press us to, to consider the question that Doris did, which is, you know, what do you do with this? So with that, I'd like to just, uh, unless Doris, you want to say anything else at this point? or Just one footnote. Yeah. One footnote, because uh, it's one thing to say, how do we tolerate otherness? Mm -hmm. um, it's another thing, and here I think I 
connect with Ishiguro's assumption about art saving us mm -hmm. in, a, in a strange way. Because it's another thing to notice these um, uh, strategies of a rhetoric of particularism and admire that which we don't expect. Mm -hmm. We do not expect to be uh, led by the nose by uh, a black woman talking to us about uh, a ghost in mm -hmm. the We do not expect um, a historian like the, uh, the Incan Garcilaso de la Vega to uh, run circles around us and finally make us feel foolish. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the admiration that these clever uh, literary strategies uh, excite in us mm -hmm. that give us a different relationship to otherness. And here, the story about my favorite mayor from Bogota comes mm -hmm. back. Because one thing that I learned from him is that the basic um, sentiment of citizenship is not tolerance, it's admiration. Mm -hmm. When we tolerate people, we wait for them to stop talking. When we mm -hmm. admire them, we tune in. Mm -hmm. So how do these writers, who are writing from a position in, uh, from which they believe they could be ignored, how do they captivate us so and make us feel diminished in our power uh, so that they excite admiration for otherness is uh, something that I would just add as a thing. Great. Okay, so maybe Chris and Kathy could sort of get um, uh, participants to come up and either address those questions or a uh, ask others, and then we could all sort of circulate. Yeah, the, um, oh, we have to they have done mute. mute. Oh, we have done mute. Uh, they have done mute. And then we have to mute. Everybody's on. Okay, we can't hear. Uh, let's see. So go ahead. Maybe use the chat to tell them to unmute. Yeah. Or like. Uh, can you hear from the can, front? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, Cool. Are the questions here? Yeah, yeah, ask just answer your ask your question you already have. Okay. Uh, so the, this question is uh, concerning the introduction of your book. Uh, you write about um, you say that we're living in the same global situation now, and um, you attribute this largely to globalization of various markets and the incorporation of quote disenfranchised people. Um, and I was just one hoping, hoping you could uh, describe that a little more or hear what everybody else has to think about that because I don't think I really um, agree that we are in the same global situation. Um, as an example, just in the, even in the literary field, um, the Declaration of Independence to um, someone from the United States is like a pinnacle of our um, like like nation being like an equal nation, stuff like that, but in, in South Africa or something it's seen as like a very hypocritical text. So um, I was just wondering what you or, or anyone else has to say about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, good. Go ahead. Oh, you can go. They got the message. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You can talk. Well, uh, yeah, I was thinking that um, I'd like to hear more from people in terms of, yeah, this this is the Earth is flat argument versus everything is completely um, localized and there's no consistency. We, we might think of, and this is why I'd like to toss it back to everyone, uh, what what kinds of notions of sameness are important to us to hold on to, and what kinds of notions of difference are uh, entertained or even celebrated, and what kinds are, as, as Doris said, intolerable that we need to listen to. Um, and you know, it's a pretty broad discussion. We might just go back to the novel itself, in other words, um, or particular cases that you're working on yourselves in which you see this kind of uh, dilemma played out. Education, citizenship, health. Um, how about some um, thoughts on that? Because I'm not, I, I can't answer the question, is it all the same or different? I think it's rather a matter of tactically addressing particular areas. 
Um, you might, might think about things like the environment. Right? We would want to have a uniform environmental practice. And Larry Summers famously said, well, we should sell, you know, pollution credits are a good idea. And that his notion was that we should export pollution into the third world and give them a bunch of pollution credits because otherwise they wouldn't have the capital with which to improve their, um, their own environmental situation. How do you guys feel about that? Is that a positive, rational economic issue in which um, it's a fair, fair answer to pollution? Or is it, a, um, is it a way for the first world simply to uh, bypass its own ethical uh, responsibilities to have clean air? Am I on? Yes, you're on the screen. Okay. Um, so, in terms of pollution and technology, I don't know that you can ha have it be a binary question, um, especially when you start talking about something like e waste. Um, Al Jazeera did a wonderful documentary on China where they look at e-waste and the people who are dealing with the e-waste um, primarily from the United States and it's horrible. They're sick because of it but at the same time it's their means of earning a living. So to like put it in a binary thing where it's absolutely bad or absolutely good is an impossibility because if you take it away there's a whole ecology connected to that bad thing that isn't universal and not it's not, it's not evident to us when we look at the problem. So I, I don't I don't know that we can like ask these questions in binaries because everything is sort of a shade of gray. It's not really black or white, but great, exactly. How about some others? Um, we actually have another question. That's can say your name so they know where to look at your. Okay. Uh, my name's Ryan. I have a question about um, David Plomo's um, interpretation of Never Let Me Go. And it seems that in chapter three, there's um, a more positive reading of the novel that Ishiguro agrees with, where even though the clones know they're going to die, they still find um, a way to enjoy the important things in life, like family and education. Um, but by the end of the chapter, it seems that the dystopian interpretation of them being clones makes this metaphor too outlandish to connect to real life. Um, so I was wondering about everyone's thoughts and whether or not they thought that the dystopian aspect of the novel took away from the novel's ability to um, connect to real life and ethics. Great question. Great question. I'd like to hear from you. Know, how exactly that? Exactly. Did the dystopian part of it press you to feel more positive about life? I mean, at least my life doesn't suck as bad as that. Or did it uh, did it completely uh, obliterate the positive? Let's let's hear. It. Yeah. Well, um, hi, it's David here at Duke, and um, I actually thought that uh, perhaps um, at least I read a tone of optimism in it, and I personally found a way <laughs> to relate to it, and I think it's. Um, about how far we take that um, issue of the clones as a metaphor. If we see clones as a possible future, then it isn't a metaphor, it's a concern for a possible future that we ought to start thinking about now. I also stretched um, the metaphor to think of the non-human. I was thinking of animals, especially <clears throat> in the part where uh, Miss Emily is talking about being uh, repulsed and trying to sort of keep her repulsion away and I think that that's very relevant for discussions around uh, animal rights. <clears throat> I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts about that. No, that's, that's a really great point. I mean, what's the line between the human and non-human animal? Um, I think I'm just going to step back and let people, I, I really would like to have students talk to each other just yeah, to exploit this, this technology. So. And to elaborate, I specif specifically thought of, of movements such as vegan abolitionism, which, which is 
trying to say that we ought not to use uh, animals um, at all for our benefit and that we should give them personhood. <clears throat> so I was wondering about those discussions on sort of total ethics, uh, bioethics in general. <laughs> the silence of the machine. Yeah. Can you hear me if I... We can, but you're echoing. Okay, is that better? <laughs> um, I'm going to see if I... Okay. Forget it. Yeah, the people have turned turn off speakers here, I guess. Maybe I should just get closer. Why and you'll see you my poor over, face. Why don't you come over here? I can stand. Sean, here. can you can you mute it I'm on there? I was thinking uh, at, at yeah, our just house. Turn, turn the sound down. Pets, and then see if you can mute the mic on that end. I can't hear. Is the mic off? Okay, how about this? Yeah, okay. Okay, good. We have mine on and theirs off. Can you turn off the sound there? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry about the Wizard of Oz aspect of this, because um, it's really not that important a point. But I was just going to say that I thought that the answer. You got to, Sean. You got to turn the sound off completely. Yeah, that's good. It's not off yet. Anyway, I thought the answer that your idea of the inexact exchange was an answer to the last two questions. Yeah. Um, and that being human enough is, in a way, something that gets beyond this. The, what people have been talking about is excessively binary. You know that you're, there's a very interesting theory of the function of literature that's in the introduction. There are the readings of the texts, and then there's the reading of the um, of this particular text that goes through a series of phases in which it looks like um, Ishiguro is not really up to the task of extracting anything out of this other than kind of the Blade Runner moment in which there's a, it, there isn't actually a Blade Runner revolt. There are people that are not, um, they're not human and they see themselves as human and then in, in contrast to the end of the Blade Runner, they're essentially just crushed. You know, because Kathy, at the, after the book, is going to go from care to donor and then she's going to have her organs extracted and then she's going to die artificially and prematurely as a result of this whole thing. So it looks for a, a part of the chapter like you are, you're not really um, seeing Ishiguro as having anything new to offer on, on this whole problem of having a morality that's out of joint with its time and so on. And then at the very end you, you do pull something out. And I, that was kind of an exciting moment for me in the chapter because it's like, I mean it, it feels like you're you're theorizing literature in the current moment as offering a form of an epistemological structuring of the world that is not available in other discourses. And that Ishiguro actually turns out to be a good example of and not just kind of a belated, you know, blinded, depressive. <laughs> but that he really does have this... Anyway, you think that's true? I, as I, I found the end of your chapter suddenly actually inspiring. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, it's sort of true confession mode in that you know, I was writing the chapter and was fairly well along in it. And then I thought you know, I should read some interviews with the guy to see how he reflected on his own novel. And I came up with those bizarre interviews which seemed to be totally wrong. And so I figured you know, what's the distance between my very sensible read and his very you know, illusory notion of what he was doing. And so I, ha I was sort of given the incentive to try to figure out what else could be going on in the novel. So that was really kind of a, a prompt to get me to think outside the ways I was usually <coughs> thinking about it. And I, I had to try to find some redemption. And it didn't look anything like what he had in mind. But um, I do think that that, I mean, I think, I think I'm right, of course, you know, that there's a kind of in inexactitude that, that goes outside the usual rational systems of exchange and is very human, right? It doesn't take part in any kind of, um, of the monetary or the other kinds of scales of exchange that the novel sets up. 
And I think that's what art is for, exactly, mm -hmm. as, as Doris was saying, too, is thinking outside of systems in unexpected and perhaps very, very idiosyncratic ways, and maybe only in ways that circulate between two people, right? It sort of breaks down the demand that has a massive scalar efficiency. And we can see efficiencies um, taking place at scales and, in, uh, and of different natures. So, but I'm glad you liked that because I really worked hard on it. But I wouldn't have done it if it hadn't been for this you know, cognitive dissonance that took place when I read his, his interview. So I, I really encourage everybody, if you're going to write a chapter on, on literature, be brave and look at the interviews <laughs> and see how authors think that they're really working and then see how you're going to work through that. Yeah. Joyce, did you want to say something? Well, I, I would like to hear from uh, some students too. I'm yeah. Like, I'm always tempted to intervene. But yeah, we, we talk. So, uh, any students here? Oh, I still want to get back yeah, to the okay. table. Okay, let me see why you sit down. <laughs> I'm sitting down all day. Uh, so, I want to get back to the animal thing. That To me, that was it was almost uh, the exact theme I, I saw when I was reading the book, or felt when I was reading the book, is that Hail Sham was like the dumb friends we you adopt an animal, but you spay and neuter it so it can't reproduce, and then it's there to give happiness to your family. And when it gets old, well, and gets expensive to take care of, you put it down. And compared to puppy mills, which seemed to be what everything was on the outside, just generate all these these uh, you know, things in horrible conditions to, to serve the same, uh, same need. So that, that was kind of my take on it, if you want to look outside the human side of things. No. Okay, how about somebody from maybe, um, whose turn is it, Duke or Senator Barbara? Duke? Santa Barbara's talking. <laughs> we, we may have to mute, mute again. Hi. Go Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so the comment that I had based upon what Sue had to say and what uh, Dave or David said earlier, sorry if I got your name wrong, um, is just this idea of disgust and when does disgust like determine how we react to something and when does disgust not play a part? So it it seems like the, the the concept of repulsion is what, what sort of ended up with this, the end of Hailsham. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, I, I guess I never really figured out why the why Miss Emily was so repulsed by when she looked at the students. And whether it was a repulsion for, um, by the actual object that she was looking at, was it, was it the students that was were repulsing her, or um, was it the this whole constructed situation? And then I think it's interesting that when we're repulsed by something, usually what happens is that we create sort of a rule to make sure that that action doesn't happen. So you might look historically at things like incest, bestiality, gay marriage, um, and then how there are certain things like puppy mills where or slaughterhouses where we mm. could be entirely repulsed by it if we see a video of it, but still not create a rule to ban it. So I mm. guess I'm just interested by this like concept of of how disgust determines what actions we take. I think it's Duke's turn. Duke? 
No, it's not. Oh, okay. Um, so I think the discussed question. No. Yes. yes. Okay. I think the discussed question is really interesting. Um, I think part of it goes back to the whole like concept of creating the other, in that um, if you can find a way to like subtype people. I don't know if this makes sense, but like concept of like like stereotypes and that sort of thing. If you subtype you can find a way to make things fit into your schema and then normalize like deviance from that norm so then it becomes a lot easier to just let discuss be your norm and then just focus on that if that makes sense so I hope that is constructively contributing to the conversation <laughs> Are we on? Looks like it's on mute. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, I'd like to make a, a, a comment here that's a general comment, but I, I hope it's pertinent. And that is that uh, this to me is an incentive to bring um, Kant's aesthetics uh, back into focus, uh, because Kant was probably much less interested in art than he was in politics and in morality. But he wrote um, his third critique on aesthetic judgment. And uh, it's because the only way he can promote judgment is through aesthetics. That, that's his argument. All the other discourses are tinged with interests, with practical or moral interests. And I think that in David's consideration of the inexactitude of that which exceeds rational thinking, we're in the realm of judgment. And that's why aesthetics is such an important um, vehicle to confronting uh, judgment. I mean, this is, this is part of, um, of the, the interest that some um, legal theorists have in, uh, in aesthetics as well. But Kant didn't only write about beauty as an incentive to judging in this free and disinterested way. He wrote about the sublime. And the sublime is about that which is scary and also that which is repulsive. Mm -hmm. And I am convinced, at least I convinced myself, that part of the reason for reviving a uh, study of the sublime is to be able to work through uh, inassimilable differences. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you're just put off by uh, a fellow citizen or an immigrant or a language that you can't even identify, let alone uh, speak, or the smell of the food that turns your stomach? What do you do with that if you are a civilized, rational, sophisticated, enlightened person? You work through that, realize that it's beyond you, and that the world is more wonderful because it's beyond you, and you're a small person. Your reason comes in to save you from fear and disgust. So there's a way of achieving a greater pleasure from a sublime prompt, which is unpleasant, than from a beautiful uh, prompt, which is already pleasant. And so I think that the optimism at the end of your chapter, uh, and I don't know if Chris would, um, would accept this, uh, could be interpreted as a way of understanding disgust not as an end point, but as something to work through towards affirming a kind of life that we didn't expect, but that's made possible because we worked through uh, that original displeasure. So uh, again, um, for practical reasons, I think that reviving our readings of standard aesthetic philosophy uh, can um, can promote um, you know the kinds of conversations that keep us um, keep us in academic talk, but also have uh, very healthy practical consequences. Okay, I think it's over to Santa Barbara. Chris. Am 
My question is. <laughs> oh, my. I'm also the tech guy. <laughs> okay. Uh, in Never Let Me Go, education is a means by which students are indoctrinated to philosophy that extends community and the greater good of the significance of the individual experience. To what extent would you argue that this notion of communal mindedness presents itself with American higher ed? Seeing as how mindful students tend to be uh, in regards to choosing areas of study, that would be seen as more marketable. Um, do you feel as though this popular consideration of social approval through marketability has the same types of ramifications in terms of discouraging artistic mindedness and individual agency as the education system presented in the issue of work? Uh, there was a lot of sorry. There was a lot of echo on that. So um, could you maybe say it again uh, without? Maybe you need to mute one of those over there, or Chris maybe can say it. Yeah, because we heard Chris okay. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you turn? Can you hear me? Yeah, that's fine. Good. Okay, um, I actually, I really liked all these questions. Um, I'll, I'll read the one that Phil just read. And never let me go, education as a means by which students are indoctrinated into a philosophy that extols community and the greater good over the significance of the individual experience. Um, actually, education is a means, sorry. To what extent would you argue that this notion of communal mindedness or indoctrination presents itself within American higher education, seeing as how mindful students tend to be today in regards to choosing areas of study that will be seen as highly marketable. Mm. Do you feel as though this popular consideration of social approval through marketability has the same types of ramifications in terms of discouraging artistic mindedness and individual agency as the education system presented in Ishiguro's work? Uh, can you hear me? Okay, Chris? Can you hear me? Okay, great. That's an amazing question. And all I can say is yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know? That's, that's fantastic, right? I mean, the way in which, precisely the ways in which art is in that novel uh, turned into a commodity and only as an instrument toward further life, but the further life is still within that system, right? So you never get outside the system. And, and also the notion of being a, what, a meaningful contributor to society, right? That that meaningfulness is only read in terms of a total sacrifice of, of all other life ambitions. So yeah, but I, I would like to hear from, from other students too, but thank you for that question. It's amazing. Thank you. What about some others? I've got to turn that off now. Okay, this is from Joanne, who's sitting over. Joanne, wave your hand so they know. <laughs> um, what parallels, if any, do you draw? But okay, this is actually similar between Hailsham and the American University. I think the drones' docile acceptance of their fate might relate to Americans' acceptance of the conventional educational path, so to speak, wherein many Americans are expected to have a university education no matter how high the cost. From my own perspective, it seems that people of my generation don't really have much of an alternative. Do you agree? It seems like too much, if this seems like too much of a stretch, that is where today's students, because of job market demands, are sort of like the clones in the novel. Uh, what do you think Ishiguro intends for this narrative to be as an allegory for in the modern world if it's not that, right? If it's not just about today's students being clones. Um, yeah, I think I think he's he's more more general than particular, and um, you know he wrote this novel before the crash, so I think that some of the issues that are so um, obvious to us now and lead us to interpret the novel in very particular ways weren't really part of his his um, sense of things. But it might have been on the horizon, so that's why I think it's a more general purpose type of of uh, uh, message that he drives. That's just taken on much more immediacy now, given given the economic situation. 
But I'd like, I'd like to hear your thoughts, Chris. I mean, since you've written so much about how notions of public community uh, through the uh, culture wars became constricted and distorted into a particular economic purposefulness. I mean, do you, do you, I mean, how, how do you feel the novel works in that regard? Um, oh. Am I on? No, now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is it? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm really very close to Doris on, on this particular point where it, it seems to me that the, the university is really about personal and aesthetic education, and that includes for science students. In other words, that it's about human formation. You know, I sort of agree with, with Nussbaum as well on, on the point of the importance of creating, you know, developing uh, creative capabilities. And, and that score, the novel seems to me to actually be saying that... Um, you know, these people, they're, they're, they get educated, they form, they're doing education through um, kind of peer relationships. I mean, this, this is absolutely at the central, center of the novel, it's something that Kathy talked, has talked a lot about in the book that we've been reading in here over the course of the term. You know, sort of a peer development, peer mutual development. Um, so from my point of view, the, the education that the students have and Helsham is a is a huge success because it develops some um, consciousness, self consciousness. It develops some um, a consciousness of and about the kinds of narratives that they are telling themselves about their own lives, which is in exactly the way that you, David, talk about as the thing that literature does. <laughs> so I guess what I mean, what I would say to Joanne and some of the other, you know questions here that are along these lines of our students being put out as clones, even if that is sort of the logic of the, the larger system, you know, Kathy's been a big critic of this as well, and it's certainly a, a central issue in the, in Hailsham, you know, in the medical establishment that has basically set up clone farms that these then progressive educators try to turn into schools, um, so that, you know, while still being mindful of the structural issues, there does seem to be all this work going on on the inside and through the relationships that is very positive. About we also have some. We also have some questions about about um, your reading of Aristotle, and you know some uh, some of the comments, um, some of your argument in the preface and the introduction. If you're interested in that. Um, sure. <laughs> that was not as enthusiastic about Aristotle as it might have been, David. <laughs> um, the introduction in the Deliverance of Others discusses Aristotle's views on rhetoric and how the validity of an argument is based on the emotions of the listener. Um, effective acts of rhetoric, this is a quotation, um, rely on the listener feeling that he could find himself in the very situation of being described. What if the listener in question cannot put himself in the other's perspective? Can he still feel emotion or empathy towards the other? And this is partly a question about the difference between Aristotle and, and Adam Smith on, um, in your reading. Yeah, I, think, I think emotion, it's a matter, again, it's like what we <coughs> talked about before. It's not a matter of so much either or, but effectiveness. And... Um, so not being able to identify with whatever situation um, is being put out there as being the required common ground, I guess that's another way of looking at it, would be that you might have a, a, some perception and some sympathy toward the position being um, promulgated, but you, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have that extra dimension of an almost intuitive sense of rightness. And a lot of what uh, Aristotle talks about is the notion that a rhetorician will never give you the sense that you've been taught something, but rather that you've come to a conclusion that you would have arrived at eventually yourself. So the speech act is really a matter of, uh, and this is what gets back to all we've talked about here at Stanford this quarter about you know, education as nurturing and cultivating and, and uh, uh, in an uh, imminent capacity in, in the individual. It's just a matter of um, the educational system being able to 
create forms of identification with the with the collective project. So, you know, getting back to Aristotle, yeah, I think that it wouldn't be a matter of either or. He's just giving. It's it's almost like a handbook on on how best to um, persuade your audience of something. And he says one critical tool would be to make them feel like they have a, a vested self-interest in the project. But if their, their self-interest isn't immediately available, and this is why I think the question is really interesting, then how much power does secondary or tertiary sets of interests, and has, this has huge political ramifications, because even if I'm not gay, but I can understand the consequences and the, and the stakes behind gay marriage, there's a way for a rhetorician for, to, to play into my um, openness to the, the general liberal notion of, of uh, individual <laughs> rights versus uh, persecution of groups. But they could tap into that secondary moment of identification, even if the most immediate one wasn't wasn't present. Um, did did you want to go next? I think. Who is up next? Okay. Chris is muted. Duke is muted too. Okay. Kathy, can you come on? Yeah. Okay. Why, why, why don't you or um, one of your students? Uh, Could someone come up? With me? Jade, why don't you come up with me and talk with me? So um, the back channel from Duke has been very active, although the front channel has been less so. So when you go on Twitter later, um, use hashtag FutureEd, and you'll see we've engaged in a pretty um, aggressive back and forth, um, Jade and I and Barry, if you want to come up and join us, Barry, <laughs> um, about, um, maybe grab a cherry, and um, about um, this idea that we started talking about before class, but it's connected to it, which is, the role of caste as a predefined um, social relationship that can both um, map onto what you were describing as an educational process of uh, can get big, creating the individual in relationship to the oh good Whew, I'm a less big head <laughs> good um, the individual in relationship to the collective. Um, that sometimes that's voluntarism, but what's so brilliant about, and scary for me, but brilliant about the Ishiguro novel, is I think he really does a great job of interrogating how much is individual and how much is actually prescribed. So have, ha I always say, want to say Havisham, but that's not really the name of the school. What, um, what is it? Hailsham. Hailsham, thank you. Hailsham is, um, Havisham is from Dickens, of course. Right. Hailsham is um, both and a, a representation of the society, but it also is, I think, a really great um, set of questions for all of us about where the individual ends and where institutions make us think that we are individuals or make us think we're collectives that may not be um, just outside of our purview, but actually against our own self-interest and what that role is in cultivating a false sense of security in uh, a status quo that we might actually be quite excluded from. And that one part of it, the educational process is to normalize, in Stuart Hall's sense, um, to normalize a process of assimilation that, in fact, we might want to never be assimilated to because the, end, the image might be quite negative uh, for us as individuals. So our success within the institution makes us even more vulnerable, not less vulnerable. So, so that was that's a, a long version of the 140 character tweets we are having going back. But I'm going to let Barry and and uh, Jade talk about that issue, and I'm going to get out of the way. So I think the interesting thing that um, I'm thinking about, just from my perspective and my disciplinary background, I'm in communication studies. We do lots of cultural studies. I'm in performance studies and media and technology studies. I have an obsession with bodies. And so when I start thinking of things, I think of the bodies. Um, one of the things that I love about literature is it brings in all of those narratives outside in culture, like the idea of the author being dead is that once the book is out there and it's being written outside of the time of the author writing it, um, it can suddenly bring in all of this baggage. And we're talking about bodies and animals and all these wonderful things, and I like to go back to the cell. Um, 
and it makes me think of the HeLa cell, um, which is directly related to education and bodies and the ability to clone and make things better. Um, and I guess I'm thinking about it in terms of also the spaces of disgust, which is which is where this started. Um, what does it do to think of a body as disgusting or not human, and where do we start placing the recognition, and where do we start putting it on structure, which I think is what our conversation is. Yeah. <laughs> like, where does it, when does it stop being bodies, and when does it become a system of something else, and why do we make that separation in the first place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what, um, what I was mostly, uh, what mostly set me off uh, was actually uh, Leslie, I think, was the one who brought this up, uh, who was spoke at here at this table earlier, um, when she was talking about, uh, I think about like, uh, you know, the, the puppy mills and slaughterhouses and how people will say that, you know, you would usually create a rule when something disgusts you, but then I talked about utility, and people say, well, you know, slaughterhouses are horrible, but people do have to eat after all, I mean, you know, meat's an important part about feeding human beings, why would we ever, it, it may be disgusting, but we, we value the utility of it and are willing to put our own you know, our own flimsy morals aside for the be benefit of society. Uh, and I was thinking about how people rationalize things that disgust them, yet people don't do anything about it, either because there's some utility or because they feel that they have no voice or because they uh, have no impact on the things that disgust them that they won't, don't want to do about it, which is why we see expressions like the lesser of two evils, uh, so on and so forth, or, or necessary evil, I'm sorry, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big part of, of, of what I tried to do in the book is exactly tap into those positions, you know, those, those points where you're toggling in between adequate reason and inadequate reason, or either to engage or disengage, right? And getting back to Kathy's comment as well, I mean, is it the individual, is it society? That's another toggle point. And one of the key uh, elements that Chris mentioned in, in the in my reading is this idea of exchange. And throughout, I mean, this is what, uh, what fascinates me, is this primary and indisputable value of um, contributing to society. I mean, this is something that uh, no one evades or no one wants to evade, even at tremendous cost. So you're toggling between you know, how much of yourself are you going to give over to society and um, what exactly you're giving yourself for uh, and how the clones are just basically asking for the minimal amount of recognition uh, and how that seems to be something that is not only um, not forthcoming, but as Natasha said, is met with this idea of repulsion. So it's, it's not even that they're being uh, repulsion or pity. Right? Either, either, either one of those uh, kicks in and neither one of them is satisfactory. So Doris, did you want to... Say anything, or you, you, at what no. point you want? Oh, no, I said what I was. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else from the Stanford side of things want to? You take it first. Can I can I ask something really quickly, just that I think is related to that and related to the conversation that's been happening, especially as we move more towards education, um, and that is what is the role of choice and all of this utility, um, because. The clones don't have a choice in terms of what they are and in education. Um, we heard somebody say, this is what we're supposed to do. That's the narrative we're given. We're, we aren't given a whole lot of choices, and choices different depending on who the person is, obviously. Um, but I'm just wondering what people's thoughts are in the, on the role of choice and utility and disgust. So I think that's why the caste thing was really interesting, because when you think of people who are in the lower caste in places, they don't have a choice um, in terms of the types of work they have access to. Yeah, I'd really like to be. I, I'd really like to hear people's thoughts on that too, for two reasons. One is, this book started off as, as you might see in chapter one. I really intended to write a book about rational choice theory, and then I realized I didn't have the math skills to really do that. Really. So, and I didn't really like it. Really. So, I, I backed off of that. But the idea of choice is really fundamental. And one of the things that came up in some discussion here was a uh, reading of the novel that really uh, um, was. Sorry, with the, with the clones as being sheep-like. I mean, uh, other uh, comments on the on the novel said, you know, they're, they're like the uh, the Jews during the Holocaust. I mean, going peaceably to to their slaughter. So I'd like to open that up to to the students to see, you know, what your thoughts on it, because I think that's a very strong reading and a very big question. 
And it goes back to a lot of things we discussed earlier about the educational system and its, and its ways of creating subjects and citizens on top of that. So I'll, uh, does anybody here want to pick up on that point? Or? I, I, I actually, uh, I'll try to get in front of one of the screens. I actually thought this was one of the aspects of the book that I found a little bit hard to believe because it didn't seem like they knew what they were supposed to do until they were ready to leave uh, the whole schooling system. And so I thought it was a little bit unrealistic that there wasn't some kind of revolt. Um, and, and so it's a little bit hard for me to buy into they just went completely peacefully into this because it's, it's not like they were indoctrinated with this idea that we're always going to be donors. And even in the activities that they were doing on a daily basis within the schooling system they were in, they weren't constantly donating things yeah. there either. So I, to me, I, I felt uh, a strong relation, like relatability to all the characters in the novel. Um, the thing I thought was particularly interesting was the character of Tommy, actually. Mm -hmm. And looking at the role of how his creating art changed throughout the novel. And so when he first started and they told him he wasn't good at it, and he basically decided he was going to become a joke, he wasn't going to participate. Mm -hmm. And then later when it regained some meaning because he thought it might result in a longer yeah. life, then he was willing to take up a new thing and actually create an entirely new art form, which was really kind of inspiring. And then even after he found out that it actually wasn't going to do any good, he continued to do it. But instead of making it a public thing, he began to do it as a very personal yeah. Yeah. Item and so I thought you really saw three different uses of art within that context for Tommy understanding his place in the world and his relationship with other people. So that's what kind of st stood out to me. But I, I didn't really see the education system as being what was forcing this mentality of, of sheep. Great. How about some other uh, other folks at Santa Barbara of you? Um. I think we're going to be, have to be um, ending very quickly. We have like about three minutes more um, for our session, our Google Hangout session. Are there any? Do you want to make any concluding concluding comments? If you want, I can um, introduce a little economic behaviorism into the Rational Choice article. I put, I made that comment on the Google Doc that I really Please like. Do. I really like the um, uh, economic behaviorism's critique and slapback to Rational Choice theory, and it's very often very humorous experiments that show us how even when we think we know our own rationality and our own choices and our own will, um, we're actually creatures of institutions that narrow their choices so finitely that we're really choosing like, you know, like we've been talking a lot about multiple choice tests in this exam. Actually institutions set up a rather parallel situation where we're choosing the best possible answer uh, among very, very limited uh, choices and a lot of what society and education does is teaching to the test. Um, that was a big metaphor, but it's actually I think um, not so. Uh, you know, I think Larry Summers' rational choice theory uh, is a reductio ad absurdum of itself in some ways, as both of you point out in your um, introductions in different and parallel ways. I thought was really fascinating. Can I but um, if you haven't read Economic Behaviorism, mm -hmm. it's it's very useful as a corrective or as a point counterpoint of view to rational choice theory. Uh, I, I want to make one comment about rational choice theory um, from my very limited reading um, of John Elster, who's one, one of the main authors in the United and, and it relates to a comment that Kip just made uh, about what it means to identify yourself as an artist, whether or not you're doing successful or even good art, right? Uh, Elster uh, talks about rational choice as the ability to self-constrain uh, when one is working. You, you uh, inherit hard constraints of time and resources and talents, uh, but a rational person um, chooses more constraints than are necessary in order to make rational choices. And the leading examples that Elster gives in a book called um, Ulysses Unbound uh, are artists. Artists know how to uh, write a sonnet in a straitjacket of rhymes and meter. Um, they know how to choose a black and white film when they have color available. Uh, they know uh, how to choose three gestures instead of ten as a choreographer. So there's a way in which becoming an artist, and this goes back to a very early point that you made, uh, is a way of um, opening up possibilities where they look as if they don't exist because one isn't exactly a victim 
when one decides mm -hmm. to be an artist. And I think that that has to do with a comment that Chris made before about uh, students educating each other through the narratives that they created, uh, unbidden, but um, but um, artful. And uh, so I, I I wanted to connect those two comments. Your and yours, yeah, I love that, Doris, and I think especially um, goes back to that idea of unlearning. One of the most important things about being an artist is not just acting within constraints, but really having an intimate familiarity with those constraints in order to know what's in them. And I think the, the, the self-deception of rational choice theory is that somehow that isn't a practice in and of itself, whereas artists, I think, so brilliantly understand those constraints as conventions and that transcription of constraint to convention is the work, for me, is the artistic inspiration. Yeah. And the, but that's a really deconstructive, profound, introspective act. And um, it's one reason our class over here meets for six hours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the crit session for our MFA students happens to be at the same time that, that um, UC Santa Barbara and Stanford could meet. So we have an overlap where Halfway through the class, the MFA students come in from their crit sessions into this class, and it adds this amazing energy because here every crit student in the experimental documentary arts um, MFA program, our first MFA program, has to go through a session where their work is critiqued before everybody, and then the next week somebody else's is. So it's a whole process of understanding not only the conventions they're working with, but the conventions they himself instill in their own works of art as a communal practice. And that's been so rich for our class, even though it means meeting from basically 2.30 till 8.30 every Wednesday. It's an incredibly rich experience. And in the um, next project we're all going to be doing in, this, in our group, uh, Designing Higher Ed from Scratch, it's that artistic practice which is so profoundly helping to shape what it means to take things from scratch in the same way that individual ingredients are put into a recipe in order to make something from scratch as opposed to package I'm learning that so well I mean on that note you, you guys have to go but next uh, the next hangouts will be with Doris from Cambridge and then Howard from Marin and we'll be talking about that is Spartan precisely this idea of you know, cre creativity innovation collaboration um, Chris do you want to say any last words or Can you? I just I'm thinking about um, violence and and disgust and improvisation. I, I was just thinking about what the Duke folks were talking about in the context of um, Doris's prologue, which we talked about earlier, uh, as uh, you know, sort of a, a methodological preamble to the kinds of activities that Kathy's talking about, where you sort of build it from scratch. I mean, I just. It, that seems like such an important example, the Bogota, you know, sort of a street situation where people are normally defensive, disgusted, phobic, and then another structure is put in place that disrupts that, and then these other kinds of interactions start happening. So, anyways, folks were, in that last round, as Kathy was talking, I was just thinking about what the, sort of the academic equivalents of that. Ah. Would be or are that we're already sort of doing in our current structures. Interesting. Is that a rhetorical question, or do you have? A, or are you going to answer that, Chris? Ah, <laughs> I think we're dying. It's an invitation. It's not a rhetorical question. It's it's really. Um, an invitation to all of us to, to think about how what we do in the academy uh, can intersect with changes we'd like to um, we'd like to ignite. Yeah. Perfect. That seems like the perfect place to end. Yeah. <laughs> in a couple weeks. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Well, that's what we do. Bye bye.